I can do Jeff's part. No worries. Excellent. Okay, excellent. So, uh, as you might know, we will be doing today RPKI Zero to Hero Resource Public Key Infrastructure. Very important topic. And we are all trying to increase the awareness. We are trying to help uh, BGP security, internet, global routing security, uh, more awareness. And hopefully today's session will be helping all of us. Uh, we have here vendor folks, Juniper, Arista, Cisco, and Nokia. Not only configuration you will see, but also we will install three different route validators. So routinators and internet labs. So also we have Octo from uh, Cloudflare, Octo uh, validator, also RIPE validator. Three different validators installment will be. Uh, as you can see uh, on the screen, the attendees name, really uh, we worked a lot. So many people, as you can see from vendors, from the regional internet registry site, RIPE with us, and also validator tools. Uh, I think all existing ones now uh, will be shown. In two hours we will do, that's why uh, I need to start immediately. So please also you can uh, share your question in the chat window. We will be, if we have, if really time permits, we will be answering them, but uh, let's start. Can you go back, can you go to the next slide please? Yeah, here first we will start with the creating ROA and how it is easy, especially on the right website, uh, you will see Natalie will show us. After that, basically another two uh, validators we will see, uh, sorry, three validators installment we will see. These will be with us for the ride. Alex uh, from NLNet Labs will also install Routinator and Luis from Cloudflare will install Octo. After that, when the validator set up, we will, start showing you how it is easy to configure routers, uh, creating session with the validators and then showing the validated, uh, validation steps. So here, Malhuar will start from Juniper, Greg from Nokia, Florian will show us Arista devices and Vinay, also uh, Jacob with us, uh, they will show us Cisco devices. So we will start with the Natalie, Natalie, uh, it's with you now. Can you start showing us the next slide, please? Yeah, go ahead. So I'm super excited to be here. Um, we are having a lot of viewers. Thank you all. At the end of the session, uh, if we have time, we do Q&A, but there will also be a slide at the end with a lot of reference material. So you can, if the demo is going too quickly for you or you can't follow every step in the installation or configuration, we have some documents prepared for you so you can look it up afterwards as well. Now, RPKI is not new uh, at all, actually. It is already quite old. It, um, it was identified as a problem in 1986. This is way back. But until 1999, 2000, um, not much actually happened. And then people uh, started coming together in the IETF, Internet Engineering Task Force, to start writing things up. What should be fixed? How should we fix it? How should we move forward? So in 2003, uh, NANOC, the Net American Network Operator Group, held a secure BGP workshop. Uh, that was quite interesting. It led to a lot of discussion and a lot of thoughts on how to secure BGP in a more pragmatic way. Um, so then in 2006, rpki.net uh, was a software tool uh, for Erin and APNIC, the regional internet registry started working on RPKI. So this is already still 12 years ago, way back. Um, and for a long time, nothing really happened. It was just there, out there in theory. It's quite hard to define best practices based on just a theory. So actual implementations were needed for RPKI to mature. And this is what we see happening today. So in the last year and a half, two years, 
uh, we saw a lot of traction happening. And that also had to do with the history of RP, uh, IPv4 running out. Um, so IP addresses became more valuable. So we saw also more routing hijacks. And all that triggered more discussion on how to move forward with RPKI. Today, the CIDR Ops Working Group is still very active in the Internet Engineering Task Force and is still working on updating RFCs. Next slide, please. Also, let's, let's not forget many large scale networks operators they are deploying uh, day by day. We are seeing announcements for the RPKI. Yeah. Thank you, Oran. So, we hope you're next. And we hope you can help you with this webinar. And that's why the slogan we chose is be the RPKI hero, BGP needs you. Uh, at the end, we also have a slide with all our email addresses. It's always a good idea to email us any questions, no questions, stupid. Uh, we're happy to help. And um, I say we, uh, next slide, please. Yeah, oh yeah, the topology, very important. So what we have is uh, the setup of RPKI really, really quick, because I think a lot of you know this already. When you create a ROA, which I will demo, demo later on, that ROA lands in a repository. And a repository is a big database together with all the other ROAs and other RPKI objects. And at the moment, there are a bunch of those repositories. And uh, for example, with RIPE NCC and ERIN and APNIC and LECNIC and EFRINIC, and all that data in those repositories, all those ROAs, they are collected um, by a validator tool. A validator is a piece of software that you have to install and run in your own network, because you're the boss of your own network, to make the routing decisions. Now, those validators, there are a bunch out there. Uh, today we'll be demo demoing OctoRPKI, Routinator, and the RIPE NCC validator. But there's also Ford, and there is... Um, our PKI client for OpenBSD. Those validator softwares, they plug into the routers. And so they feed the data into the routers where the routers can make the actual routing decisions for BGP. So uh, the validators basically say, is something cryptographically valid? Feed it to the routers and then the routers match the BGP announcement with the list of ROAs to see, hey, is there a ROA that matches, a statement that matches, or do we see something else happening? If something else is happening, so there is a ROA, but the BGP state does not match that, then we consider that as an, a BGP RPKI invalid ROA, and it should be dropped. That is the goal of this webinar today, is to show you how to drop invalid BGP announcements. Next slide, please. So we will not uh, uh, local preference uh, decrease for the invalids. We will reject them. That's important, guys, uh, rejecting the invalids, uh, because I think we, we discussed before with Malhior, actually, uh, just decreasing the local pref as a policy in BGP policy for the invalids will not help you at all. So uh, let's continue. And that's why in today, our configuration on the routers will be rejecting invalid policy. Okay. Natalie, it's your, your time again. Please show us how we can create ROA. Uh, I know it's really easy, especially uh, right website uh, to do that. Let's see how you are defining this length how basically uh, we are creating rule on the right website step by step, please. Yes, thank you. So my name is Natalie again, and I will show you how to create your ROAS. A ROA stands for Route Origin Authorization, and it is a cryptographically signed statement about which AS number should originate which prefix. There are two ways to create a ROA. The first way is to use the user interface from your regional internet registry, like RIPE, LACNIC, APNIC, ERIN, EFRINIC. But if you prefer to run your own certificate authority uh, and store your own keys, you can install a software package called Krill and create your own ROAS there. But today I will demo the RIPE NCC uh, member interface. 
So, by the way, uh, you cannot see the screen if you are sharing. I will share moment. my screen, yes. Okay. So, I think now you should see the member portal of RIPE NCC, right? Yep. Yes, okay. correct. Yeah. As a first step, you need to log in with your SSO account. And this is a single sign-on account that you can create yourself. My account is linked to two LAR accounts, as you can see. Oh. And today I will use the account for Melchior. When we go to the RPKI dashboard under resources, you will see a couple of things for um, immediately. There are currently two BGP announcements. And uh, these announcements um, are collected by RIPE NCC through their route collectors. So they have a bunch of route collectors all over the world that collect routes, feed in to this dashboard to show you what do we see uh, being announced at the moment, specifically for you, for your LAR. Um, so that here, if you look a little bit under down in the BGP announcements, you see two announcements, one for a slash 22, one for a slash 24, and the current status is unknown. That means that there currently is no ROA for those prefixes. So let's change that, which is quite straightforward. As Oran just said, we just tick the box and then hit the button, create ROAS for selected BGP announcements. It asks you to review and publish the changes. And if you click that, you will see that the two announcements go from unknown to valid. This is exactly what we want. We just verify, is this the announcement that we want to see? Is this announcement correct? If I agree and I want to create a ROA for these, I just hit the publish button. And here they are. They are now valid. If I want to change the subnet mask, I can also do from this window, right? I'll get there, Aura. Um, OK, so next. There is one more thing I would like to show, and that is the use of the max length. Because the max length uh, attribute in Aurora defines what is the maximum prefix size that is allowed for this ROA to be, be, be valid in BGP. So for example, if we have this slash 22 here, this ROA now, if I go to ROA, you can see it a little bit better. This is the ROA I just created. It has a max length slash 22. And that means that you have to um, announce it as one slash 22. If you announce more specific from that, that is being seen as RPKI BGP invalid because the max length is strict. It is good practice to set the max length exactly as how you are going to originate a prefix. So if you are only planning to announce that slash 22, create a max length of slash 22, which is the default. It is recommended if you plan to announce more specifics to create separately ROAS exactly matching those prefixes. So that is important. Uh, this is the most thing, the most common thing that, that goes wrong when people create ROAS is that they make a mismatch in the, uh, in the prefix length. So that is max length is an important attribute and be as specific as possible. I think that is the, uh, the thing. If I want to create an additional ROA, that's quite straightforward as well. I just hit the blue button. Blue button. Yeah. And it shows me a screen. I can fill in any AS number. A prefix that belongs to me. I cannot just hijack anybody's prefix. Uh, the interface will only allow a prefix that belongs to me. For example, this prefix does not belong to me, so I can't put it there. And here you can play with the max length as well. 
that concludes my demo. If you have any questions, my email address is on the slide later. Back to you, Oran. Yes, can you go back to uh, agenda slide? I think uh, now these will be next and they will show us how, okay, now we've seen how to create RAW, but uh, we will start installing three different validators as I told you. So write, Routinator and Octo. Uh, next is, yes, please please uh, show us how to install write validator. Now we will see the prefixes there uh, from different regional internet registry, five regional internet registries we have, as you know. So we will see those uh, entries in those, all validators actually, maybe different implementation, but at the end, number of states uh, will be the, almost same in uh, all the validators. So can we start now? Excellent. And you will set to yourself in a loop, I think. No, yeah. okay. Uh, so, hey, hey, hi, I'm Thies from Ripe MCC, and today I will show you how to install the Ripe RQI validator. Ripe RQI validator consists of two components, the validator and the RQI server. The validator retrieves the RPKI objects from the repositories over rsync and HTTPS, and the, RQ, uh, yeah, and the RQI server connects to the validator, gets the validated objects, and serves those for the, to the routers over the RTR protocol. For this installation, I'll be following the installation instructions that we have on our GitHub page. We package the validator for CentOS, for Debian, as a Docker container, or for anything that runs Java. And because we're using an Ubuntu, Ubuntu machine, I'll be using the Debian packages. The installation consists of three steps. First, I download the packages and install them. Then I conf uh, need to tweak the configuration a little bit. And then I, start, then I start the validator. Let's go. So as I mentioned, the first step is to download the packages and install them. I seem to have lost my focus of the screen here, so I need to copy the link again. So if you do a live demo, you need to be sure that you actually can copy something. Okay, there it is. So I'm downloading the RTR server and the validator itself. And I will install those two packages. During this installation, the dependencies of the packages are also installed, and that includes Java and some other uh, tools that are needed. After the package is in installed, you need to adjust the configuration. By default, the validator and the RTR server listen only on local hosts, but because we want to connect to the validator from a, from a router and we want to see the web interface, we need to adjust these settings. So for that, I'm going to adjust the settings for the, for the validator. And instead of listening on local host, I'll make it listen on 0000, and the settings for the RTR server, which needs to listen on 0000 for its, uh, for its web interface, and also for the RTI port. Now I've adjusted this configuration, so I can start the systemd service for the RTI server and with the validator. Well, I enable them, then I start them. And let's check that they are actually running while checking the systemd log file. You see a bunch of output here, and that means that the validator is actually doing something. OK. Now, when it's installed and it's listening, you can go to the web interface to validator. And you may notice that there's only four trust, trust anchors here. Arin is missing. We cannot, we cannot distribute the Arin tall. So you have to download that yourself from the Arin website in the right validator format. For this, I need to download this file and upload it to the provided script. Okay, that output looks good. Now, when I look in the validator, 
you can see that there are five repositories here, and they are all pending. If I take a look at the monitoring of my uh, backup instance, you can see that the validation run takes about 15 minutes. So in about 15 minutes, the validator, the validator should be ready, and it should have the new row that Natalie just, just created. If I take a look at the backup instance, at the backup instance itself, you see a validator that already has finished uh, loading the ROAS, and you can see all the repositories that are there. And if you open a repository, you can see the amount of objects that come from there, and uh, the invalid objects. And for an invalid object, you can also see what what validation errors or, or error occurred, and what error and where the object is from, so in which repository it's located. The validator can also show, also show you the row, all the rows that it knows about. And in this case, I will show, look up the row that exists for a test range for which there are invalid announcements. So when we look up the test range, we see that there's a row for AS196615. But if we, look up, look, if we look at the BGP preview, which uses the, the BGP announcements seen by the, the routing information system, you see that there is an invalid announcement. And when we open that, you see that there's an announcement for AS12654, but that there's no ROA with a matching AS, but there's a row for this prefix. So this announcement is invalid. Yeah, this is my demo. Let's continue on with Routinator. So thanks, uh, Thies. What we've seen here, uh, our install was required extra effort, it seems, and I am expecting the same thing. Uh, for the other validators as well, and I am I am uh, basically wishing to hopefully see also Arin in the list and not extra step for this. So next, I think Luis will be will be showing us uh, Octo, I think, right? So Octo validator, I think. Should be. I can show uh, Octo RPK, but I thought it was Routinator. Um, I can just a second. Can... Let me see in the agenda. Actually, I yes. Been wrong. Ru Routinator will be Alex. Uh, will show us yeah. Routinator. Okay. Alex, are you yeah, ready? I can do that. I'll share my screen and I'll give you a demo of uh, Routinator. Hi, my name is Alex. I work at the Nelnet Labs. Um, I will be demoing Routinator whilst I, I keep my, my cat out of the screen. Um, I should do. Uh, there we go. All right, can you all see this? Yes, we can, yes. Alex. Oh, okay, wonderful. So um, uh, you saw that TS installed the uh, right uh, validator from a Debian package, but uh, Routinator, uh, we develop it uh, a lot with, with uh, very frequent releases, uh, and we decided not to do any packaging for it yet. Um, so we're just going to build this from the source, um, which I'll be demoing live. That should be lots of fun. Um, what Routinator needs in order to run, and it basically goes for all of the validators, is rsync. Uh, the rsync uh, uh, protocol is, was used, especially in, in the past, uh, to fetch data from all of the different RPKI repositories and download them to your local machine in order to be validated. So that's one part it needs, and what Routinator also needs is a C tool chain. So those two elements I'm now going to install. So, that's done here with a bit of luck. And then the next thing that we're going to do is actually install uh, Rust because Rust is the language that um, Routinator was programmed in. So that is going to be my next step. There we go. So I'll paste in the next line. Uh, basically, I'm downloading it uh, from curl and then piping it to bash. Uh, I understand there's some security things there, but you know, I'm just going to go through the, the quick demo here. Um, I'm going to proceed with the default installation. And it'll store all of the components in order to install Rust-based applications uh, and using its packages. So that should be fairly quick and pretty easy to do. So I need to uh, configure my current shell. So I do a source cargo env. There we go. And then the next step that we're going to do is just do a cargo install routinator. Um, 
it'll download all of the, the different dependencies uh, that uh, Router Native relies on, um, package them up, and create the application. Um, that'll take a bit of waiting. So in the meantime, I can tell you about uh, the transition that we've made from uh, using rsync to using HTTPS. Because more and more and more, uh, you see that uh, repositories support the so-called RRDP protocol, uh, the RPKI Resource Delta Protocol, which relies on HTTPS instead of rsync in order to download data. And the great thing about this is that uh, you, you can use a content delivery network and that kind of thing in order to distribute the data. And it really decreases the load on all of the distributed systems. Because in the olden days with rsync, uh, as the data set grows, in order uh, for you to fetch data, uh, the server needs to calculate the differences between what is on the server and what is on your client. Um, and all of the RPKI repositories got hit uh, more and more often as more and more people start installing RPKI validators and also fetching data more often. So what we see in the wild right now is that about a thousand validators uh, are installed in production worldwide and they are hitting the repositories on a temporary basis. Um, the, the RFC uh, uh, in the ITF says that you should fetch at least once an hour. Um, that is something that is done by uh, uh, quite a number of organizations. But you see that the desire to get fresh data is pretty big. And it's actually quite reasonable right now uh, to fetch data uh, once every 15 minutes or once every 10 minutes. So that is also the default that Routinator has adopted now. If you start it up um, and you don't change anything in the configuration, it'll fetch uh, every 10 minutes by default. Um, when it does the very first run, uh, it'll download 500 megabytes of data. Um, all of the RPKI repositories combined contain 500 megabytes worth of ROAS. But in order to install an update, uh, or, or to fetch an update, it's usually only just a couple of kilobytes. So it's actually quite light once it has its initial, initial data set. Um, you can see that I now installed the package. Uh, and the next step is for me to initialize the application. Now, I do this by typing routinator init. And the first thing it will do is give me an error message or at least a warning. As Tish just uh, explained, uh, Aaron does not allow the redistribution of their trust anchor locator completely freely. So you have to download uh, or, or you have to go to their website, read the terms and conditions, and if you agree to them, then you are allowed to download the file. It's an explicit thing that you do. But they also give the option to build this into your software application as long as it's a clear, non-ambiguous thing. It's, it's in people's faces. And that is basically what the init command does. It's, it says, look, uh, you have to make a decision about the errand tile. If you want it, then you have to explicitly write that you accept the errand RPA, and then you're good to go. And that is provided that you read that PDF file with all of the terms and conditions. So I'm going to do a routinator init accept errand RPA. And now it created the cache directory for me, where it's going to download all of the uh, 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 different ROAs and certificates and all of the cryptographic data. And it created five trust anchor locator, uh, uh, locators for the five different regional internet registries. And the last thing I'm going to do uh, for this demo is to start a Browtonator and I'm going to give it a minus V so it shows some verbose logging. I'm going to start it up as a server and I'm going to enable the RTR server on port 8323. And I'm going to enable the HTTP server on port 8080. I'm going to fire it up. And the first thing that you'll see is that it connects to all of the different trust anchors um, and starts downloading data. This will take about 10 minutes. And after it's done, or whilst it's ongoing, you can see in the browser that if I go to uh, the web interface, then it says that initial validation is still ongoing and I have to wait. So this is one that I installed earlier. And you can see that it already has a serial number. It downloaded all of the data for using rsync and the rest using HTTPS. And it currently already has some connections from routers. That's about it.
That's all I wanted to demo. So, Alex, uh, uh, I want to ask a question. When you talk about actually RSync and RRDP, so yeah. you, you said more and more we are now seeing RRDP. Uh, mm -hmm. Was it because uh, it to reduce the repository load? Yes. So basically with rsync, the server is involved in calculating the differences between what is on the client and the server. And uh, if thousands of validators start doing that every couple of seconds, then that doesn't really scale very well across the entire internet. And yeah, the, the web nowadays is built around HTTP and making something scalable like that is much better done using HTTP. So that is what everybody is now transitioning on. Fun fact. Um, there are only two repositories left that rely completely on rsync. That's the one for LACNIC, and that is the one for JPNIC. If those two repositories update to RRDP, basically we could be running validation without rsync at all. By the way, in the meantime, initial validation has completed. So now I downloaded the 500 megabytes. Um, the serial number is zero and it will now send out a notification to routers that they can start fetching data over RTR. So Routinator is now ready to go. It's serving data so to routers. Now, uh, Routinator is ready as well. When we configure the, our routers, will we connect yeah. to your server as well? Yeah, it's totally yeah. available. Yeah, so I guess now Louis is next. Yes, Louis, please, uh, can you show us? Octo, yeah. so from Cloud Player. Okay. Yeah, I'll stop sharing my screen and off you go. Thanks, Alex. Thank you very much. Um, hi, everyone. So I'm Louis uh, from Cloudflare, and I'll demo the installation of our validator, which is Octo RPKI. So I'm going to start sharing my screen in a second. And here you go. So what you have to know with our validator is it comes into two pieces. Uh, the validator part and the RTR server part. So the RTR server is the part that talks to your router. We chose this system to distribute. Uh, we put the Go RTR at the edge on our, on our pops and it fetch a JSON file, which is produced by the validator. So we have this distributed model so that we are actually as close as possible to the router. And while we have the validator in a safe place that we monitor and keep an eye on. So the RTR server, the RTR part is very simple, and very lightweight. So it can be embedded uh, on the router. It can be uh, put on, on the server. Um, but here in this demo, I will put the validator and the RTR server on a single virtual machine. So both. Uh, both are available, uh, both tools are available on github.com, cloudflare.gortia, and uh, OctoRPKI is available on slash CFRPKI. So you have multiple ways of installing it. Uh, I will show you the uh, Debian package uh, version. Uh, at the moment, we have two virtual machines. One is already running with the Docker version, but I will not expand on this. I will just demo the um, I will just demo the Debian packages. So let's start with GoRTR. So first, uh, you once you're going to release this, you will get uh, the the Debian package. Uh, and on the machine, I will wget. I lost the connection. So I will double you get um, the, the package and go out here. I will install it. And it's, it's almost ready. The service is not started yet. I will I will start go out here right now. So by default, without a validator, it will connect on the Cloudflare JSON list that we provide on rpki.cloudflare.com. And this allows you to get started. Like, if you want to run a test, 
get started uh, very quickly. You will, um, you can uh, start with uh, directly go RTR. It will be automatic and provide the RTR server on port eight two eight three. Um, so if I do journal CTL, you will see it has started. It has fetched uh, the data and it's ready. It's listening for connection. So now for the um, validator part. So it's the same thing. Let's download the release at the beyond file. And installing it as well. So just like it was said before, the uh, Irene requires a specific um, a tile, uh, specific, like, it requires you to agree to the RPKI, uh, the, the Irene agreement, like the tile agreement, so uh, the RPA. So you need to download it separately and paste it in. And so you go to the Irene page and you need to paste it uh, on, on the tile directory for the validator to work with. So at the moment, uh, the Octo RPK only supports up to uh, this version. Uh, it doesn't support the latest version with the RSync URL. So you need to use uh, this version. So I download the Irene tile. I will put it into the user share Octo RPK tiles, Irene.tile. And by default, uh, Octo RPI is configured to read this whole directory and, and use all the tiles readily available. So you can uh, list in the directory, you have all the tiles. So now I can, now I need to pass a special argument since we're running the GoRTR and the validator on the same machine. I would just ask um, Octo RPI to listen on a different port. And I'm passing arguments into the um, Octo RPKI config, which is, called, which is in etc default Octo RPKI. And I choose not to sign the output file. So um, now we are ready to start Octo RPKI. So systemctl start Octo RPKI. And CTL. And we can see it's already synchronizing. It's fetching the rsync and the RDP repositories. So both those tools provide Prometheus endpoints. So you can uh, visualize the state of the validation. So an example is with the other version running, you can see how many rows you have on the RTR part, how many connected clients, when and for the validator part, when was the last validation, how many rows per, per uh, registry. And while it's uh, being, uh, while it's fetching the initial state, we ask now GoRTR to connect to um, CFR, uh, to Octo RPKI. So we pass a same config, which is in etc default GoRTR. So we, since we did not set up uh, the validation of the JSON file, we just disable it um, and we indicate the path um, the, the JSON output produced by the validator. So now that we have this configuration, we can rest we can restart. And we will see it's restarted. And at the moment, it's not an, it's, uh, the output the JSON is not available because it's still fetching. Uh, but once it's ready, this will refresh and you will have all your ROAs available. Um, so you can track and I will refresh currently and you should have, uh, it should collect soon at least, the output of the validator and well, it doesn't seem to be available right now. Um, and and you're good to go. Now you just have to configure uh, the your routers to go out here and on the port A to A three. Guys, I think Luis, uh, it's done as well. It's really 
in uh, 30, 35 minutes, we installed three validators. It is really easy. And meanwhile, by the way, we have been discussing uh, some technical things. Now, actually, uh, thanks for uh, showing this, uh, Luis. Uh, I am sure we have some documentation how to install step-by-step -step installation guide type of documentation, right? Excellent. Yes. So before we start configuring the routers, uh, maybe or we start, I think uh, there are a couple questions. Uh, very fast, let me uh, read the question and also get the answer. Natalia, I will also want to discuss just uh, one of them, one of these questions with you. I want to ask a specific question to you, please. Uh, first one, uh, this is important because people might confuse. Uh, high panel, do, do we need to include our uh, downstream ASs in ROA? Uh, uh, basically, no, because you only need to include the your origin AS, not the downstream AS. Every AS, they will uh, create a row for the prefixes uh, from their autonomous system, not downstream upstream, which actually brings me to our discussion. Uh, I have a video on, uh, on my YouTube channel or on my YouTube channel with Malior. We discussed ASCON approach for the pet validation, actually he wrote that draft. Uh, there, different things, but we are talking today origin validation, specifically RPKI. So definitely when you uh, create a ROA, you need to uh, create it for your own prefixes, for, for your own AS, not downstream. Another question, this one I want to discuss with uh, Natalie, please. Can we create ROA for a prefix that can be announced by more than one ASN in case of DR, uh, those redirection, etc. Uh, multiple ASNs are allowed, but uh, is there any limit, Natalie? Uh, what's the procedure if we will create the ROA for multiple ASNs? Yeah, uh, no, that, that works. Yeah, ROAs can overlap, and also ROAs can uh, have a different ASNs. But you have to create a different ROA, so a different statement, basically, for every prefix uh, if you have different ASNs. So if you have prefix slash 24 with ASM1, you have to create that ROA and a separate ROA for the same prefix ASM2. Okay, this one was nice. By the way, we have three uh, validators shown today. And uh, there was also a question, uh, which one based on the statistics, uh, most of them are used. I think route nature, a uh, little bit more than the others. If I want to use, uh, more than one validator, and I think for redundancy, I should use two at least. But uh, is there a reason to use three of them? What do you think, Natalie? Well, I would ask the validator people, but uh, for redundancy, I would I would pick two two different ones. Uh, that okay. is. I, I will I will discuss this with the Malhior as well. Thanks, uh, Natalie, for the answer. Malhior, Malhior, are you ready? Yeah, I am. Excellent. So let's start. Let me share my screen. So you should see my terminal now. Yes. Which is uh, logged into uh, a, uh, so by the way, I'm uh, Mel Gjermans. I work with uh, Juniper Networks. And uh, so I'll be demoing how to configure uh, RPKI origin validation on a, a Juniper router. <clears throat> In this case, it's a virtual MX. Um, and as you can see, we only have a very basic configuration today we're going to start with. So we have configured um, a BGP with uh, one neighbor. Um, and um, so let me show you actually the, the configuration, how it is done. Actually, the configuration of the validators is, is really easy. So um, we configure uh, a group, or in this case, three groups and uh, three validators. And then we commit that uh, configuration. And as the validators are already uh, set up, we will um, immediately see um, uh, uh, validated uh, ROA payloads coming in. Um, so this will take some time to get them all in. Oh, there, this is finished now. So let us continue configuring some policy. And um, uh, I'll copy paste that in right now. This is quite a lot. So let me change the output a little bit. So what we'll be doing is 
Now that we have the, um, the database filled, the RPKI uh, database, we um, create a policy which takes actions based on um, the validation state. Um, so if we start at the top, we see a term which is called valid. Um, so if we uh, receive a, announce, a BGP announcement um, that matches against a valid ROA, then of course we will accept it. Uh, the second term is called invalid. Um, and uh, basically what we want to do, and that is what we discussed Orhan, Jeff and I in, in another uh, webinar three weeks ago, is that we want to reject invalid announcements. So we have a policy that if uh, a BGP announcement matches um, or doesn't match with an existing ROA, then uh, we reject it. That could be invalid ASN, uh, so invalid origin ASN or um, incorrect uh, max length. Um, and the third term is unknown. Uh, unfortunately, there are still quite a lot of uh, routes uh, that are not covered by a ROA, um, but as we do need those routes, we will accept them. Um, and, and the last three lines you'll see is basically uh, creating the communities uh, so we can also tag the routes. Um, now that we have a policy, we of course need to um, apply that policy to our BGP session. And that is basically this last uh, uh, comment I just entered. Um, so that basically says, uh, now apply the policy we just created uh, to our uh, BGP session. Um, uh, and it's called an, an import policy called validation. So if we commit that, then uh, now if we do a run show route and i'll use this route for example you see that it has a validation state of valid um, and of course we can also do run show uh, validation database um, and you see all the uh, 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 all the roas if you do a run show route a uh, validation state invalid for example that's probably going to be empty um, as we were rejecting all invalid routes um, and if we do a valid we of course get a whole bunch of routes um, so basically everything we need to uh, configure in order to enable our pki uh, origin validation on a juniper router is basically what you see uh, on the screen here And um, so that's it for Juniper. These are all these are all the uh, steps to basically enable RPKI on the Juniper router. But uh, yep, exactly. it was very fast. So it was very fast. What we will do now? So we are going uh, basically ahead of time. I think a couple couple things we can discuss. We have anyway. We have more time than we planned. No worries. So for the same question, Melior. Uh, at the moment, and other vendors also will configure those three sessions. So why three? Why not two? Or let's say why even two? For redundancy, what 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 else do you think? Well, so in this case, I configured uh, three sessions because, of course, I wanted to see if all three validators were working. Um, uh, but yeah, as Natalie was uh, was saying, um, I would my advice would be to uh, at least uh, have two validators, of course, configured for redundancy reasons. Um, um, uh, uh, three could be more redundant, but then uh, uh, two would be enough. Um, Not sure. What happens when you receive conflicting information from uh, different servers? Huh, that's a uh, very good question. Uh, it came from the White House, I see. Nice background, uh, Jeff. <laughs> um, so it, 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 um, uh, it depends a little bit per BGP implementation. So the answer could be different for, uh, for Cisco, Arista, Nokia, and, and Juniper. Um, unfortunately, there is no serial attached with the ROA, so you cannot really sort of decide which one is the, the best one or the latest one. Um, so um, there's no real clear answer to that. Um, the good thing is, however, that it's um, that you should not receive um, a different uh, uh, output from different validators because the input is the same. 
uh, right? So all the three validators or in general, all validators get their uh, data from the IRRs. Um, so it would be really strange if the output would be different. Um, I can tell you what happens on Cisco. Um, yeah, and the, I can, uh, I can uh, on the Cisco, um, each one, uh, um, uh, a, a prefix is validated. If any rower exists to uh, make a prefix valid, then it will be valid. Um, so, so if the if a rower is received from one particular validator but not the other one, um, then it then the prefix will be valid. So, uh, if, if there's any if there's any rower from any validator, it will be valid, and that's the way that. Um, it's uh, it, it's, it's good to be now, on safe, safe side, I think. It's now, good now that, that's the right way to do it. Now, now yeah. on um, um, uh, now when rowers are being updated, they can be updated at different times. So you can get transient periods of several yeah. minutes where you have different rowers being received from different validators. Um, so they can be out of sync for um, for for many seconds and maybe even minutes. Um, and during that time. Um, uh, we have to make allow allowances in the code for that to happen, um, and so therefore, if there's if there's a, even a single rower from any validator um, that will validate a prefix, that prefix will be valid. So there's no problem. Uh, looking at Juno's can... configuration, I would think that it depends on order of policies created. So in your case, you were allowing before denying. So if you have both, you will probably permit one to get in, right? Yeah, yeah. And it could be also totally opposite. So uh, if I see uh, somehow, uh, I could deny in the first place, but it, it, you wouldn't be on the safe side, I think. Uh, uh, so yeah. So yeah. Um, if, there's, if, there's, if there's at least one rower to validate, it's valid. It's valid. Yeah, I can. It's, it's the same on the Arista side. So the moment you have multiple validators um, and you have one valid rower, the prefix will be deemed valid. And next, actually, uh, let's continue with the next demo. I think it will be Florian Arista. Am I correct or Greg? Greg, it's Greg. Greg, okay. So uh, please, Greg, share with us Nokia, how we are configuring the routers. And then so far, really, uh, all the validators as well as the routers, just five, 10 minutes, maybe even less. Uh, time, even creating raw, it probably took a couple of minutes only. So it is uh, easy steps. And for the validators, I should say, uh, if I am not familiar with uh, maybe Linux, etc., step by step guides uh, all of them have. So uh, it will help us anyway. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Warren. My name is Greg Hankins. I'm a product manager with Nokia, and I'm going to show you how to configure origin validation on a Nokia router real quick. Um, I'll just show you our basic setup. Um, I have uh, uh, two BGP peers configured with full V4 and V6 routes. And then uh, we also have uh, obviously no RPKI sessions and also uh, the database is empty. So I'm just going to go and load a configuration. I have a, a pre-configured uh, configuration that I'm just gonna load. And then I'll show you what it does. So all of the configurations do similar what Melchior was, was explaining. So I'll just uh, explain a couple differences, um, but all the steps are the same, setting a policy, setting a community, and then setting up the validator. So we create the uh, ascending communities here, and then next we create the policy. Now I'm doing something a little bit different. Um, I'm going to accept invalids. This is just a troubleshooting step that I'm doing. Uh, obviously we want to reject invalids at the end, and we have a separate path selection a configuration that we'll use to do that. But the goal is to reject invalids because it's known invalid routing information. So there's really no good reason to accept it. So we're gonna set different local preferences based on the uh, origin validation state. So we'll just do that here. And then we're gonna apply our best path selection. We're gonna make sure that we use the origin validation state in our best path selection. And then we're gonna tell the router to just reject invalid invalid state anyways, and then it doesn't matter what the policy does. We're gonna turn on origin validations for v4 and v6, then we'll apply the policy. And the last step is just to uh, configure the three validators. So we've done that, and now we'll just show you how, 
how fast it loads. Um, I've configured the three RPKI sessions. And you can see they've um, started to load. And this is actually a router in New York talking to servers in Amsterdam. So uh, within uh, about 20 or 30 seconds, it's fully loaded. And then we can show you some information. So we'll show you the uh, database summary. And you can see that they're still loading. Uh, we just, uh, okay, there we go. Now they're almost fully loaded. So that's very nice. And then we can also see some origin AS information. So we'll look for this AS, which is three, four, five, six, two. This is the AS that Natalie configured at the beginning of the demo. And we can see that we've already gotten this prefix, which she signed at the beginning of the demo in the database and it's valid now. So uh, we could also look at the prefix directly. If you wanted to do that, you could do 45, 141, and then, uh, oh, and then you can see that it's also in the database. So now I'll just show you real quick how you can see that the uh, local preference and the policy is actually being applied. Remember I set it to uh, 100 for unknown, 110 for valid, and 90 for invalid. So you can see there's no 90s because they're being rejected by that best path selection knob. There's a whole bunch of 100s that are invalid and a couple of 110s that are actually valid. So let's look at the specific details for that route, which is 45, 141, that's 16. And you can see that uh, before, these are the original attributes. It comes with a, a local pref of 900 and the origin state is not found. That's what we're getting from our IBGP peer. And then after we apply the policies and run it through BGP route selection, you can see that the local pref is 110, which is valid. We've uh, added that extended community that we set. And you can see that the origin validation state uh, is now valid. So a couple more show commands. Uh, if you wanted to see the different states, so we can look at um, all the different states for origin validation. So let's just look at all the invalids. Uh, this is a step I added for troubleshooting. Uh, in case you just wanted to see how many invalids you're getting, uh, you can see there's quite a lot. And actually, uh, if we just run it through, um, if we disable pagination and just let the router uh, run the command, you'll see that there are actually about 4,000 IPv4 invalids and uh, about 400, 450 IPv6 invalids. So that's a good indication that there is quite a bit of invalid information in the routing table. And uh, it's probably a good idea to turn on origin validation because you're gonna, you're gonna uh, remove a significant amount of invalid routing information that you don't want in your routing table. Uh, and that's all I had. Okay, uh, thanks, Greg. Basically, these these guys are really easy. I am now thinking we really took a lot of risk. These are live demos, both uh, validator people and uh, also renders. Uh, they are doing live demo, and we are seeing uh, it just works and very fast. Uh, I think it was around 133,000 prefixes we are seeing, uh, and global routing table for IPv4 unit tests. I think around 800,000. So it makes more than like 15% of the prefixes I think now we have ROA, right? So, uh, and increasing. There is a, one question before we move to uh, Arista configuration. By the way, time-wise we are going well and uh, I like some uh, questions. Many questions are good, but some of them are very long. That's why I'm not uh, reading them. Uh, Alex, maybe we can discuss this question with you. Uh, you answered that, but also for the live audience, for also we will be sharing this uh, recording on YouTube channels, uh, right, or on our YouTube channel, etc. We will be sharing. So later on, people can see. Any config needed on validators to accept sessions from routers? Basically, after you, also we can discuss with Keys and Luis as well. Yeah, so by default, if you start up the session, um, uh, the, the RTR session on a certain port, it will just accept all connections uh, uh, from all IP addresses. 
of course, it is possible to lock this down uh, with a firewall configuration or access control list or something like that. Uh, but there's no configuration needed on the validator itself uh, in order to make that work. It'll just accept connections from every uh, from everyone. Uh, we've cool. seen configurations with uh, uh, RPKI validators accepting up to like a hundred router connections to a single validator instance. No problem at all. And then uh, we don't need authentication before uh, session come up, etc. No, we don't need. It. No. Okay, and I think uh, same thing for you, Tees and Luis, right? So for uh, other validators, Tees, are you there? Yeah, I'm there. So any any anything needed from the validator side, <clears throat> like no. authentication? No, right? So you so, yeah. can set up authentication, but it's external. And um, optionally, of course, you can firewall, you can firewall it, uh, especially our HTTP interface. You do not want it to be available from the internet because it has an API that everybody can use. Uh, but in practice, the RTI server, I think you can, you should firewall it, but I, you, there's no configuration you need to open it up. Yeah. Yeah. And when we looked at configuration of the routers, you could see no additional parameters to provide authentication or any kind of firewalling were provided. So you could derive from it that you can just configure a session and it will get established if you do nothing else. Okay. So how you are doing that background, Jeff, by the way? <laughs> it's nice. <laughs> Every time I have seen everything. Okay. So next we will discuss uh, Arista. Florian will be showing us how we can configure RPKI on the Arista routes. Thanks, Orhan. Um, yeah, so my name is Florian Hippler uh, with Arista Networks, and I'm going to show you how to implement uh, RPKI origin validation on EOS. So First of all, same as Greg, I'm having a full table in our lab. Um, so what we essentially going to do is configure a route map, which then does a well local prep for, for valid prefixes, changing it up, um, dropping invalid prefixes, and um, leaving it for unknown. That means no row is existent. Um, as it has been mentioned a couple of times, the rejecting part is, is really important for your internet edge security. Uh, so then I would say, let's go ahead. Um, I prepared um, a bit of configuration here. So as I said, what I'm essentially going to do is creating a route map, matching on origin AS validity, saying it is valid. Um, the same for not found, and in the end, then dropping the invalid ones. That's just a route map. We don't have any, um, we don't have any uh, RPK validators configured yet, as we can see here. So no cache servers are configured as of now. This is what we're going to change now. So we're going to go for inside the uh, router BGP context and start configuring the route caches. We're configuring all three route caches. Um, and that just means it's enabling a connection towards the validators. We also want to enable the origin validation itself. This is something I am doing now. So we have multiple options here as well. First of all, for how, how we want to proceed with eBGP neighbors, uh, IBGP neighbors, redistributed ones. So in our case, full table is eBGP. We will do uh, use the local ROA database um, for IBGP routes which we're going to send towards our internal network, we will actually want to attach the origin validation state as an extended community. Um, that's essentially the full configuration for committing it. Um, it's starting our PKI. And we can see we're successfully connected to all three cache servers. 
just to verify, same command as before. Uh, we can see connection is active on all three of them. We're in the mode syncing, um, that takes a while. In the meantime, we can see if we already learned some rowers, not yet. Um, that will pick up soon. Already see we're learning something here and the total number is populated at the end. Um, to give you an idea how it will look in the show command, if you're looking at a valid or invalid prefix, um, you will see once you configured our PKI, this particular one, AS origin not validated. In this case, we're still learning the rowers. So we don't have a state yet. Let's see where we are, still learning. Um, the moment we have learned the uh, rowers, it's being processed in the system and we're matching against the AS origin validation, uh, the, the AS, yeah, well, we're matching the prefixes against the rowers. So, yeah, still takes some time. Please note that this is not running on a uh, physical appliance. This is running on a virtual appliance. So it might take some more time. Should have everything soon, yes. Yeah, that looks good now. Yeah, we're still in syncing state. Yeah, and there we are. So we matched against the rows. We see slight difference here. And this is essentially what um, Alex and Jeff mentioned earlier on. Um, and uh, sorry, um, Alex and Jacob, because you can have different sync intervals on the validators. So one validator might actually give you um, slight more or less rows. This should catch up within um, probably five minutes. I think 600 seconds is the default on the uh, row refresh time on the validators. So let's see if, yeah, BGP is still um, processing the rows now. Um, in the meantime, what we also doing with, as I said, this particular comment uh, so we EBGP we're processing locally, IBGP um, we're adding the uh, extended community for origin validation state um, to accept it on a neighbor. We would need to also say IBGP um, community instead of send. That way we would uh, use the RPKI state origin uh, state validation. Um, to accept drop or, well, to flag the prefixes accordingly. Um, and there we are, it's done now. So we see origin validation for 1.1.1.0 um, slash 24 is now valid. So you can also have a look how many prefixes, for example, are invalid. Um, Let's see. And there we would then see um, that in the show IBGP um, state, we do see an additional field here, which either lists them as valid, invalid, or unknown. And this is just stated in front of the prefix. So that is my demo. Um, Florian, Thank you. Florian, also Alex, uh, this one, I want to discuss something here with uh, probably both of you. Alex uh, said when the validator first time download from the repository, it was around 500 megabytes. Uh, it was taking right space. Yes. Yeah. But that is yes. signed cryptographic data. Um, exactly. All ROAs, all certificate revocation lists, all manifests. So that is the, the, the heavy part. But what the RPKI validator does is uh, validate all of that information and basically produce a flat 
text file of as prefix max length. Just the text file, nothing else. And that is what it feeds to the routers. So all of the heavy lifting is offloaded from the router to an external device. And what the router receives is a tiny bit of information. It's just a flat text file with a list of prefixes, ASs, and max lengths. Which this makes adoption really... of PKI actually going on. And that's what made BGP set so complex, right? We've completely offloaded all security validation and all heavy lifting that requires crypto operations of box. Yeah. So it's all done so on the server. Definitely not feeding 500 megabytes of data to your router. It's just a tiny text file. Yes, exactly. And uh, what Jeff was saying, it was important. There was a question basically triggered me to start this discussion. So when we have, let's say, instead of two validators for redundancy, if we will have three, let's say, and will it be uh, 500 miles? Uh, of course not. So uh, all the heavy lifting, like decrypto and uh, validation, is done by the like, external server, not by your routers. Let's understand this. But and that's why actually RPKI we call it offline cryptography. BGPSEC, which uh, Jeff was mentioning, we discussed by the way BGPSEC and other pet validation mechanisms uh, with Melhior also uh, on uh, on our YouTube channel. You can watch. All online cryptography method. That's why it's a much burden for sure for the routers, not the RPKI, not today uh, what we discussed. Uh, yeah, but can I add one thing to this? So, so you have to also keep in mind that you got like, oh, uh, we're talking about heavy lifting here. But um, RPKI validation is not time sensitive. So because it does a validation run every 10 minutes, it basically has 10 minutes to go through its entire data set. Uh, so that also means that you can basically run these validators on a Raspberry Pi with like two cores. It's fine. It's, it, 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 if it has like four gigs of memory or two or four or something like that and a couple of cores, it has enough time to go through its data set to perform the validation in order for to be finished in order to start the next run. So you don't have to think about provisioning your uh, servers to run your validation on as like these giant boxes that need like uh, six cores and eight gigs of memory and, and lots of SSD space because it's really not like that. Uh, it, it, disk space will grow. It's currently 500 megabytes and you have to imagine that 20% uh, of all BGP is covered. So if we cover the other 80%, we're going to end up with a lot more disk space, but what it needs in terms of memory footprint and and CPU processing power, it's it's really not that much. Don't yeah, overspec your servers for the validators. It's really not necessary. Maybe four or five gig. Uh, that would be probably enough for because uh, I think he's also calculating eight hundred. 23,000 prefix we see, by the way. Uh, I remember Florian output. So by the way, that, that's also another discussion. Why uh, 823,000? If we will look at from another looking glass, we will see different maybe numbers. If you are deploying RPKI, if you are not deploying RPKI, there will be some even differences between uh, what you are seeing in this AS, number of IPv4 global IPv4 prefix, et cetera. But uh, uh, my, this question, Alex, Three validator on router, let's say if I set up this session and 133,000 prefix at the moment I am seeing, approximately how, how much extra memory usage it would cost? But that is, that is a question for the router vendors. So what is, what is the uh, memory, foot, uh, uh, memory footprint uh, Florian, impact you, of each router? Sure. Florian, maybe that is a very good question. Um, I could only tell you how much I use right now, um, <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> um, I yeah, I, very good question. As I said, um, probably I don't know, Melchior. So, but uh, yeah, I well, think I, I, I've just looked it up. I'm currently using with uh, three validator sessions configured, um, 70 megabytes of memory. Three of them. Yeah. So I have the three. 
the three sessions still configured. So I have in total uh, 467,000 uh, RV records, um, which results in 143,000 prefix entries, blah, blah, blah. And that results into 70 megabytes of memory uh, utilization. Yeah, I can what? chime in. For me, it's like 75. Okay, 70, 75 from three validators. And as of 2020, when we received from each validator around 130, 140,000 uh, prefix and 130, 140,000 uh, ROAS, by the way, is around 15, I think 15, 20% of uh, 800,000. So if, even if it increases, it's not much a job, uh, too much work for the validators and not exactly, not at all for the routers itself, actually. Instead of three, if you even if you can configure it five different uh, validators, it wouldn't be a problem. But generally, I mean, this is not problem at all, even number of session wise. It generally is a design rule. Uh, I tell people two is company, three is crowded. So two, two is enough for redundancy. But anyway, it's your preference. Next, we have Cisco. Uh, we will see uh, RPKI configuration on Cisco routers. We have actually uh, Jacob and Vinay who will be doing this demo, guys. Yeah, hi. So, uh, so I'm Jacob Height. So uh, I've worked on the uh, RPKI on Cisco XR uh, for some time. Um, however, uh, Vinay has recently been uh, uh, working more on it than I have. And so Vinay will, uh, Vinay has prepared a Demo, so you will take it away. Go, Thank Vinay. And thanks, Jacob. Start. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Yes, I'm going to. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I just want to share the screen. Can you see the screen now? Yes. 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 Okay, thank you. So basically, I will try, try to show some of the basic things with uh, PK on uh, Cisco routers. We are using the XRV9. Uh, so I'll try to connect to, to the validators that were configured in the session earlier. So as you can see, there's no RPK server right now configured. So we'll go into the config T router and uh, uh, router BGP. Uh, I'm using this router BGP here, IDS number and stuff. So if I can show the commands that to be configured, so basically, we need to configure a simple co configuration like this. So basically, it's going to be a server uh, IP address that we need to know. Uh, so I'm using two these two IP addresses. And uh, uh, the transport is either, in this case, it's a plain text uh, transport TCP port. I have the 83223. Uh, we also support the SSH uh, transport also for the connection here, uh, which would require uh, username and password for the, uh, the same. So I'm going to just configure that here, uh, and then I'll commit it. And uh, we can see the uh, summary here. Uh, I think the right now it's not established. Uh, it, it will take a little bit extra. It's established now. And you can see they call the ROAS are uh, uh, learned here. Uh, and uh, we can also do a little more. Uh, detailed output like this, which shows the, uh, the server, the server and the uh, details of everything here. It's an established state right now and on uh, the 747. So the same thing. So I think we have all downloaded all the uh, ROAS here and uh, for IPv4 and V6. Uh, this is the one we were using for the routinator, which was set up earlier. Uh, I will try to use a little bit of a different for topology now. Topology in you know, to uh, basically go over uh, a few more steps actually. So I was thinking, we were thinking of using this kind of a topology here. So basically we have a routinator here, which is going to give all the ROAS to mm -hmm. us. And then we have this uh, topology where we have a, a, a XRV9K here talking to an ex, ex, extra, uh, external uh, uh, BGP neighbor here, um, and then talking to one more internal BGP neighbor here. So that way we will, sh I'll show, I want to show like when uh, this outside uh, outside node actually sends us a invalid uh, prefix, uh, we compare that with the ROA and how we reject it and in, uh, as invalid and uh, how we drop it. And in other cases, how we can control the best path, the calculation also, 
uh, depending on the validity of the state, the validity of the states. Uh, let me just share, share, share that one. And it will send the extended community in the IBGP. Yeah. So I'm just showing the three boxes here. So this is the IBGP, which is basically talking to the routinator. And this is the box which is talking to the, which is the peer uh, ASR, xrv 9 k which is talking uh, uh, EBGP with the, the the box here. And it, this is the one which is going to send the in, in, uh, invalid uh, prefix to us. So I just added the invalid prefix over here. Uh, uh, so that, uh, yeah, this is one of the invalid prefix that is being sent here. So this will send a prefix of 136.00 slash 16 uh, with the AS number of two, uh, of, sorry, one, which is going to be invalid uh, uh, prefix. And our router will go, we will detect it and drop it uh, uh, and things like that. And also I will see that it will not be used in case when the best, best path, actually there's no other option, but the only one there is still you will drop it actually. So, and this is the other internal peer, uh, which we are going to uh, display the, uh, the, the advertisement. So I'll show with, start with the, so we can see the summary here uh, for the, uh, this thing. So we have one uh, uh, routinator connected here and I can show you the details of the testing here. So we have like around 133K. So we have this here and then we can see the details uh, and correspond to the refresh time, response time and the purge time and other things like that. And also we can uh, So this shows the RPK table that has been downloaded from the routinators now. Uh, we can see all the details of them. And the same thing for YV6 also, we can see them. Uh, so this is the one which is downloaded from the routinators and they're in the database right now. And then uh, uh, we can show you the... So this is a simple uh, configuration so that, that we have. So we are talking to two neighbors here. And uh, right now there's nothing configured for validity and other things like that. So all the, because with nothing is configured, the invalid uh, prefixes are used actually. So they are used in, in, the, in the best path calculation and also they're sent to the neighbors and stuff like that. So if you see like uh, in this one here, so the, see the prefix here. So you can see this is the one which is downloaded from the operators now. This is the actual correct one. And uh, if you see the uh, output here, so we can see this is the one which we learned from our peer, which is invalid actually, but it is still being used in the best path calculation now because we are not configured any of the uh, validity checks and things like that uh, according to the RFC. Uh, so that is what we have here. And then when we configure the uh, uh, the validity checks and stuff like that, so then we can actually start doing the uh, in implementing the validity things like. Reject invalid, please. Yeah. So this shows the validity right now. And if you see here, and the, these things are all disabled right now because we are not configured any uh, uh, configuration for the ROAs and the things like that right now. I mean, we are only kind of connected to the routinator for downloading the ROAs, but we are not actually using it in the uh, best path calculation and advertisement and everything like that. So that's one thing. Unless the operator goes and configures those configuration, we will not start using them. So I'll show you what the configuration that we can we configure basically. So this is what we configure. So this is basically showing like uh, we configure the origin validation enable. So which basically says that we need to start using the validation ROAS and stuff like that now. And also this will say that we, we can signal the extended community to the internal neighbors and stuff like that. So that is done now. And if you see in the so we have to enable it because we can enable it in different VRFs as well. So we need to enable it in a specific VRF that we're using. Yeah. And if you see it here now, like we can see that this one is now actually marked as invalid right now, uh, because now we are enabled the variety checks and stuff on the different, uh, uh, we can control the way where we enable it on the VRFs or uh, on the neighbors 
And so it's right now marked as invalid because we, we started the, uh, configuring the uh, validation state uh, as per the RFCs. And then we, we will see also that we are not sending it out in the best path calculation to the peer actually. If you see on the peer now, uh, we will, uh, uh, yeah, we are sending it out, but because we are not actually marking, not used, not to be used in the, uh, uh, in the best path calculation right now. So if I add the configuration for that, in the configuration, I can add like basically saying, uh, we can take, use the validity checks in your uh, best path calculation also. So now actually we will start, uh, uh, we'll not send them anymore actually, if you see here. Uh, so that will not be sent out to the peer also. So even in the case of the our network now, so this is like, it is, we are learned it from the peer, but since it's invalid right now, it's not being considered as a best path. So we are just storing it and not send, advertising it to anybody. So that's how it is now. So we have the control of now, like basically saying whether we want to use the validity check state and also whether to send them out or not, and also to whether to use them as a best path calculation. Now. So just to uh, going over the configuration that we did now. So basically, uh, this is the servers, the cache servers we talked about. And then we have the origin validity configured here, which basically says in the global table now, right now we want to use the validity checks. And this will say like, we want to use the validity checks again. And uh, for the best path calculation, we want to use this one. That's, that's what it's saying. And this is saying that we want to signal the, uh, for the in internal neighbors also, whether the external community is uh, present or not. So that's what it, it is showing it. And if you can see here, we can see, see the, uh, the, so that, that prefix is not learned over here now. And also we have one uh, uh, configuration, which basically says that uh, in some cases, maybe we want to allow the invalid uh, states also. Uh, that's what I wanted to show here. Uh, basically you can say, uh, some cases the operator wants to force a invalid also to be used in case of uh, uh, the best path calculation, we can do that. Uh, and then we can basically say like, uh, so it's, it's going to be used now in the best, best path calculation now, but it will st still be marked as uh, uh, invalid, but it will still be used in the uh, best path calculation now. So in the sense, like if you see the, uh, if you see the committee, uh, committee being sent out, it will say actually it's invalid but it is still sent out so that the, the controller and the operator can control in, in a way that he wants it. So it is being signaled here uh, and it's still saying said as invalid, but she's being used in the best path calculation still. Other than that, actually we also have some uh, configurations where we can add the uh, prefixes for saying like uh, uh, mark it as valid forcefully. That's also other option that, that can be done by the operator now. So those are different operations we have, uh, options we have. Let me just show that one for quickly to uh, complete the demo. So we can say like this, and we can uh, uh, in the row was no, in the week we can configure a thing called as uh, so RPK route that what way whatever we were saying we can mark it as like a valid route right now. For example, if you have any lag or something in learning about the ROAS, we can do this way. So that way we can, uh, so that way now it's not labeled as invalid anymore. Uh, and it's also being used in the best path calculation. And if you see on the peer now, uh, so you can see it is marked as valid now. And uh, uh, that, that way you can control, you have the full control over the uh, validity of the states now, and uh, depending on what the use cases are. So this is a manually configured row on the router that is not imported from the server. Right. Yeah. And uh, yeah. other thing is like we, we can do the VRFs and stuff like that also here. And uh, uh, we have the netconf yang and uh, other and the route uh, policy. Did, I mean, I've got the route policy to test for the oh, um, right. invalid. Yeah, let me show the local preference. Yeah. yeah, let me show the route policy. Yeah. So the validation state can be used in the states uh, checking for the policy now. So in the case we have the validation state in the uh, statements here, uh, we can use in the policy statements. So we can drop or anything like that. So we have the invalid state and then we have the valid state, which is uh, when the rows are matching the prefixes. And uh, if it is not found, then we come here in this case. Uh, and also we have the case of not found is also another state we have. Uh, I think otherwise we can, we can actually do the things called like uh, uh, disabled state also we can check actually. So that's how it is done. 
the disabled state is when the routing, uh, uh, when validation is not enabled in that work, then it's disabled. When it is, when validation is enabled, but it's not found, then it's not found. So not found and disabled are different. So not found unknown, basically. Okay. So there is no yeah. unknown state. The state's called not found. Not found means that um, validation is enabled, but it's not found in the database. Disabled means um, validation is not happening. Good. Can we see how many uh, invalids at the moment we are seeing? Yeah, I can show. So right now, I think uh, I have marked at the invalid one. I, I just had one invalid actually because uh, that one is being uh, marked as valid right now. Because but I can go to the one with the uh, in the other one. We can do that there. We can do in the demo run network behind that. So that one we can do it here. Yeah, yeah, we, we see a lot of uh, understanding. Uh, while uh, you're showing it, there are two questions that are IOSX are related. One of them is you've shown only two RTR connections. Is there a limit? Can you do more? Why two? Question. Yeah, we can, we can do more. Yeah, we can do more. Actually, I did not do that because some sort for some reason the connection is not going through in this case, and that's why. But uh, as we can show, the like invalid and not found and the valid states are shown here, so we can and do that way. Yeah. Question number you, two, whether you can uh, make a uh, connection to RTR server VRF aware. So not from management uh, VRF. Connection to the RPK cache today, I think is global today, but we can apply the RPK validity states on uh, uh, VRF and global, uh, both, both actually, yeah. Thank you. So you can so run the internet in a WRF and validate it in the WRF. But the uh, but the server is connected through the default VRF. Yes, yeah, so I think the question was with regards to reachability of yes. the server itself. Yeah, just last one. I think I think just to the uh, validity state. Uh, this thing. So just just for showing it, I can show the. RPK road policy here. Uh, okay, it's not happening. Okay. So I think I can just show it in the in document here. So basically, this one just shows the uh, validity state. Basically, we have the invalid, not found, and valid. And uh, this is the case for the disabled. So I think this hopefully this is more clear now. So I think, yeah. Now, this is also such a simple like, configuration that we use. So uh, to explain cache server here and then the prefix, uh, and we can mark as a ROA on the box. Validity being used. Yeah, and also we have the netconf react right now for the uh, monitoring and stuff, and also telemetry support is also present in the uh, on the box for XRB9K. And I think that should uh, complete my demo. Uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, by the way, can anyone say how many uh, invalid prefixes at the moment we are seeing around? Hundreds of them, right? So if uh, yeah. I think hundreds of them already there. So there's a question, in fact, what is question I want to talk about a little bit. Uh, Alex, you already answered, I've seen that. Maybe here we can also uh, discuss about that. It's so 5,820. 5,820 invalid prefixes. Invalid prefixes. Yes, and uh, why is this too much? Actually, good question. So there might be, uh, of course, hijacks there, maybe sub prefix, exact prefix hijack, but uh, many times we are seeing also this max length field is used wrongly. Can we talk about this max length field? Natalie, we can talk also on this, Alex. So because uh, when you create on ripe uh, database, this ROA, you mentioned, Natalie, about the uh, max length field. And I think <laughs> this is very important field and people are using wrongly, and that's why most of them, not maybe most, but uh, a lot of uh, invalid 
prefixes we are seeing. Can we talk about this? Natalie, maybe you can start. Yes, very short because we're wrapping up this session. This will be the last question, Oran. Um, Florian is ready to put his slides up. So um, the max length field is indeed the field that causes the most problems uh, in, in uh, ROAS when people create them because they don't understand the use for uh, the max length field. So that is why we recommend to set the max length strict. So put the max length exactly the same size as that you're originating. And uh, otherwise you end up with problems or your prefixes might get dropped as they become BGP invalid. I think that answers yeah. your question. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much for this. By the way, uh, in less than, much less than two hours, we finished uh, three validator installment and four router configuration uh, routers basically connected to three different validators and got 130,000 prefixes from uh, each one of them and uh, approximately all uh, demos took maybe five to 10 minutes, something like that, so maybe even less. So by the way, on the screen at the moment, you can see our emails. And uh, I wanna thank, especially Mel, who are, uh, most of these folks uh, he brought together and uh, it was great effort. Manuel, I think uh, you want to add something. Actually, before we closing, uh, from each one of you, very short, uh, we can take, what's your suggestion? Uh, maybe we can start with this presentation here. Name Manuel, you can start, Alex, etc. We can continue like this. Yeah, so first of all, I want to thank everyone who participated. Really awesome that we were able to bring this much people together in such short notice and actually do this live it was really cool. Um, so my takeaway would be, I hope we were able to show you how easy it, it is to configure uh, RPKI, <clears throat> set up ROAS and, and, uh, or create ROAS and, and set up validators. Um, uh, if you have any questions, please do reach out. Um, I think that goes for everyone. Um, we're all very excited about this and, and, and willing to help you with whatever questions you might have. Also, you want to take someone, I remember. Yeah, that's the next slide. Florian, if you want to put the next slide up. So uh, here's the additional resources. If you want to read uh, about the configuration uh, we use today, there's the link to the Google Docs. Um, and there's a few links which are really interesting um, uh, if you want to read more or want to start uh, deploying RPKI yourself. There's a few folks I want to thank in particular, uh, Nicole Weyer, Edwin Verwoerd, uh, Job Snijders and Max Tucci. And um, in, uh, there's one company I want to thank that is uh, i3d.net who sponsored the server and uh, the full transit in order to make this demo possible. So thank you very much for your help. Okay, can go back to previous slide please? And I think next, Alex, Alex, what you would say? What's your takeaway? Um, my takeaway is that uh, basically we've shown how easy it is to install validators and how easy it is to set up uh, a connection to a validator and start validating and dropping in pilot. But I, what I would like to urge people to do is once they start creating ROAS to maintain them, maintain your ROAS, make sure that they are updated. Once, uh, you, it, once you start creating ROAS, more and more people start dropping in pilots. So you can lose connectivity if you don't maintain your ROAS. Please do it. Thank you, Alex. Also, I think my turn. Have a look at MARNs as well, mutually agree, uh, agreed norms, definitely. And uh, they are all aware they help also for this uh, webinar to be happening. Uh, we have, because uh, there you can see lots of filters, etc. We talked today origin validation and RPKI specifically. We talked also, uh, I talked with Jeff Tanstra and Malhuar on the specific pet security, pet validation uh, aspect, uh, ASCON draft actually. And we have other uh, videos also on YouTube channel, but you can follow me on LinkedIn, uh, I'm using Orhan Erwin, please add me there. Uh, so you can follow up all our updates, Jeff and Melchior, we are producing some videos. Also, we have other like Alexander, Azimo, ASPA draft, BGP sake, lots of things. So I want to produce more and more this kind of videos, not only RPKI uh, 
uh, but also BGP, other security side, uh, pet validation, etc. Please follow up uh, by connecting with me on LinkedIn or uh, that's it. So Greg, what was your takeaway? What you would suggest? Uh, I just wanted to add my thanks to everyone. Um, I mean, this literally came together in a couple hours. So uh, I think it was great that all the live demos worked. Uh, I would just urge everyone to go and and uh, look into RPKI deployment. Uh, there have been several presentations over the past year or so by large providers analyzing the impact of dropping invalids. And the, the general conclusion is that there's no impact. So um, as we said earlier, there's no reason to accept invalid information into your routing table and you should just start dropping it. <laughs> good, good suggestion. Invalid reject in the beginning we said, but some people uh, we are seeing also maybe even transit operators uh, probably they will transition to invalid uh, reject policy, but uh, let's see, hopefully. Uh, Jacob. Yeah, hi. Um, uh, thanks uh, for Jeff for inviting me and Melchior in particular for the support you've given me um, uh, with, this uh, with this demo. Um, uh, I would say to people who want to uh, implement RPKI that uh, um, in Cisco on XE and XR, we've had it from... Uh, Many years, in fact, um, and I think one of the, I think I think probably the hardest part is do not invalidate your downstreams. Um, so if you um, so if you um, uh, sub allocate your prefixes, um, make sure that you uh, that your rower does not invalidate um, your sub allocated prefixes, so that uh, so that your downstream can uh, um, issue their own rowers. Um, and uh, even if your downstream does not issue their own rows, make sure you do not invalidate them anyway. That and, and the max length help, um, helps with that. Actually, no, it doesn't. No, 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 your downstreams, your downstreams have to sign the rows. Otherwise your row will invalidate it. Yeah, okay, thank you so for that. That's that. Next, Orian. Thanks, Orhan. Um, yeah, I mean, I want to thank everyone um, bringing all the people together here. I mean, it shows great effort. It shows what the community can do. Um, back your peers if they don't sign their prefixes. Um, make your make the internet more secure and drop invalids. And therefore, I'm actually handing over to T's. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was a really awesome demo, I think. And I really hope that we could show you, you all that it, this is not as hard as you may think it is. It's not that scary. You can go figure it. There's really real proper documentation that we collected while doing this. And yeah, it was an off, uh, awesome effort. Thanks, Melchior. Luis. Just want to say thanks. Uh, thanks for inviting. Thanks for organizing. Um, it's I, I don't have much else to add about that community is great and there's a lot of things that have been done in the last two years um, like, uh, older like now uh, like two days ago what uh, was hurricane electric deployed RPKI I mean now we have almost like the biggest transit providers the amount of RPK invalids has dramatically lowered uh, so yeah um, thank you uh, it's API is even easier to deploy these days than ever. So, okay. Yeah, and hopefully we, we can see even more. And I'm uh, positive on that. We will see even more uh, operators that will deploy this. And hopefully we can help it a little bit, maybe, this video. And Jeff. Jeff so Hansen. number one, uh, I would like to thank you, Winai. And we forgot to put his name on the slides. It's going to be updated just after we finish. So nothing makes me happier than seeing community coming together and solving common issues, right? That's what we do in ATF and RPK came from ATF. So there's absolutely no reason for you not to do this. It's not a rocket science anymore. You don't need to be a wizard to do this. You've seen how easy it is to configure on routers. The installation of validators is straightforward. So I would say just go and do it. There's absolutely no excuse or reason not to. And thanks everybody for coming together. Probably within the last two, three days, everything was organized. It was pretty amazing. And thank you everyone. That was completely amazing.
the work of a team and how fast and how great we did it, or you did it actually. <laughs> it was really great effort and Natalie. Nothing to add here. I think this was a really good example of how the community works. Set up your ROAS and enjoy your weekend. Yes. Deploy your, deploy your RPK. It's not hard, really. And thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. And deploy RPKI. Bye. <laughs>